everyone. Welcome to the ArtCast. This is episode four. Uh, it's a 12-week limited podcast covering landmark games from Dr. Arthur C. Bartner's five decades at USC and a discussion on the band's traditions. Uh, video for the podcast is available on the band's YouTube channel and Facebook page, but you can also find the audio versions only on Apple, Spotify, and Stitcher. And Dr. Bartner, uh, welcome in again. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you. It uh, uh, should be a we had a We're good show last week. Football. Yeah. yeah, Georgia football. We had a fun last week. Uh, we did a later show. We did it a little bit later in the week when we normally tape it. Um, but so I feel like we just talked recently, which is good. It's always, this is so enjoyable just being able to talk to you and talk about some of these USC traditions because it's so much cool stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also look forward to it. So today the show should be uh, an interesting one. We're going to talk about, I know it's going to be one of your favorite games. So it's the... 1980 uh, Rose Bowl. So tons of NFL dudes on that team. We're going to talk about that. Uh, great game you know, for Heisman Trophy winner Charles White. Uh, USC played Ohio State in the Rose Bowl. So we'll talk about that and what you know, kind of implications of the season and stuff. And then later, we're going to talk about the traditions, the USC Trojan Marching Band in the Rose Bowl and playing in the Rose mm -hmm. Parade and going to the Rose Bowl and stuff. So I know there's some fond uh, memories for that. So really a Rose Bowl-centric uh, episode four for us today, Dr. Bartner. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah. So we're looking forward to this one. Let's, uh, all right, so let's kind of start off with that 1980 Rose Bowl team, obviously the 1979 uh, Trojan football team. They had some studs, Dr. Bartner, on this team. So let's pull up a, a graphic here. You got Charles White, you know, Heisman Trophy winner, Marcus Allen, the blocking fullback, he ends up winning a Heisman Trophy later on. Ronnie Lott, mm -hmm. one of the greatest of all times. Anthony Munoz, uh, you had Brad Buddy on the offensive line, but also guys like Hall of Famer Bruce, Bruce Matthews. You had Dennis Smith, Jeff Fisher, went on to become an NFL head coach, Joey Browner. Um, USC was undefeated, and like the 1974 team that we talked about, only one, they only had this one Pac-12 blemish. It was a tie to another Bay Area team. Uh, this time, it was Stanford, and it was 21-21 tie, and uh, USC led 21-0 uh, at the half. Uh, you probably remember that well, Dr. Barter. Yes. I, uh, having befriended coaches, you know, through the 50 years, uh, it is tough. It is tough to be up for every game, and, and you know, and then you're playing – uh, arch rivals like UCLA, Stanford, Cal, Notre Dame. It's just really tough to go undefeated. And that Stanford game, uh, and I believe it was our home game. I mean, the first half, we were just smoking them. You know, 21 <laughs> nothing, and they couldn't move the ball. And then as John, you know, almost apologetically says, we just came out the second half and stunk up the place. And, and just, you know, funny things started happening, and we kept them in the game. And before you know, the game is tied. And, uh, you know, it might have cost us a national championship because they didn't win a game after that, and they beat, beat Ohio State, you know, in the Rose Bowl. So we could have ended up, you know, tied with Alabama for the national championship, except for this tie. Yeah, that Stanford tie. Yeah, right. I mean, it, no question. I think USC came into the Rose Bowl number three in the AP poll mm -hmm. and number two in the UPI. And Ohio State comes into the Rose Bowl, uh, that 1980 Rose Bowl, number one in the AP and I think number three in the in the UPI. Uh, but the Trojans were over a touchdown favorite, seven and a half point favorite going into that game. Yes, I, you know, this, uh, I, I mean, we've had some great Trojan teams, but this team was loaded. I think 15 members went on to play in the NFL. Uh, they were all high draft picks. We had a Heisman Trophy. We actually had two Heisman Trophy winners, not in the same year, obviously. And we had a, 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 a Lombardi Award winner with – Brad Buddy, we had Ronnie Lott, who was a Hall of Famer in the NFL and probably, you know, the best safeties 
ever at USC. And of course, uh, Anthony Munoz is a great story because he got hurt, you know, the first game and he was, uh, you know, out the whole season. And he came back for the Rose Bowl and, 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 and was just, well, you know, his career uh, with the Cincinnati Bengals, but he just did a phenomenal job opening up holes for Charles White. Yeah. And I will show some of those Charles White highlights in a bit. But so for that Rose Bowl game, some other interesting factoids. Pete Carroll was an assistant for Ohio State. His, I think it was his second year as a paid assistant. You probably didn't get to talk to him then, though. Yeah. Well, you know, you know that's a trivia question. Oh, because, okay. I, first of all, who knew that Pete Carroll was going to coach at USC and, you know, have a great decade that he had and uh and who pays any attention to Ohio State coaches Not <laughs> me. you know the only one I remember of course is, is Woody Hayes uh but uh, I find this after the fact and uh you know they had a great secondary by the way and and the only way we beat him was on the ground and with these stud line, these stud offensive linemen, and, and that's how we beat them. We didn't beat them through the air. Yeah, it was. Uh, so USC did jump out to a ten nothing lead, uh, but then right before halftime, I believe Ohio State comes back, ties the game. A couple field goals for Ohio State in the second half, and it's sixteen to ten. And then late in the game. Uh, you got one of those, I think, student body left, student body right situations going on. So I'll play you the uh, the highlights, and you got Pete Arbogast, the voice of the Trojans, um, uh, on the call here. So I'll uh, I'll play this one for you. And SC missed another field goal try in the early fourth. Ohio State added one to make it 16 to 10. Then the Trojans made some history on one of the greatest drives in Rose Bowl lore. Heisman Trophy winner Charles White took the game over. First, a run of 32. Charlie White, he's running like you can sing to this one. 40, tackled from behind at midfield. Then a 28-yard gallop. It's White again. 45, 40, 35, 30. He's all the way to the 22. Charles White is over the 200-yard mark today. Gentlemen, Charles White has set a new Rose Bowl record, 215 yards rushing. Marcus Allen, who would get a Heisman of his own two years later, was the blocking fullback for White on this game. Pretty good backfield. He got five. Then Charlie for three, for five, another two. White, touchdown! Eric Hipp added the all-important extra point. And the Trojans won it 17 to 16, and White kept right on running all the way to the locker room. Pretty impressive. Uh, that's a good way to win a game. Just hand it off to your Heisman Trophy winning tailback. Let him dive into the end zone. You don't see a lot of those dives over the top anymore, but that was a good one. By the way, it doesn't ha hurt having Marcus Allen blocking <laughs> in front of him. I mean, I think he maybe carried the ball one time. Yeah. They in, showed in it was like a three-yard carry or something. Yeah, yeah. And, and then there's a picture of John on the line. And I, and I love John. You know, he, he and I became very, very good friends. And he was, I could never, I could never get, he's so calm. And he said, I was the most intense guy <laughs> anywhere. You know, I'm just, that's just who I am. And John, just, just another day at the office. I, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. It's funny he noticed how intense you were. It's hard not to. Uh, but you're right. Yeah, Charles White had 247 yards, 39 carries. Seems seems yeah. like a lot. Uh, wow. But he was the player of the game. Obviously, uh, it's one of the still one of the highest rated college football games of all time. USC ended up finishing number two in both polls. So, like you said, that tie. You know, not having that tie, they could have uh, you know been a national champion. And uh, 15 guys on the team you already mentioned became. NFL players and four of them are in the NFL Hall of Fame. So a uh, pretty impressive team for the Trojans yeah. in 1979. Yes. And, and again, uh, you know, I, I, got, I got a lot to meet a lot of these. You know, back in the early 70s, you know, it's like, who's our partner? You know, is this 
30 year old kid nobody ever heard of, you know, trying to figure out how to be a marching band director. Now this is 10 years later. So now I get to meet some of these guys, Marcus, Charles, uh, uh, yes, Ronnie, you know, I, I, I got to meet these guys and, and talk to them. So I was kind of a known uh, commodity. Uh, so it was, it was fun. We really felt that we were part of the team. And of course, John Robinson uh, played a big role in that. Yeah, it's great. Great stuff. Uh, that's a great game. I think uh, we did a, a ranking of uh, we tried to like rank the all time teams during like the quarantine on uscfootball.com. And that 1979 team didn't win a championship, but it was it was up there. I mean, because of all the, the talent, it's one of those teams that they should have won one. But yeah. it, you could argue it's, it's one of the greatest of all, it's certainly one of the greatest of all time for USC. Yeah. By the way, there's, there's another great story because you know you talk about the Trojan family, which I love to talk about, but the Matthews family, you know, yet Clay Matthews and then Bruce, his brother, and then the son Kyle, and then of course Clay the third, who who became this great linebacker, uh, not only at USC but for the Green Bay Packers. Uh, what a great Trojan family. Uh, and they had long, uh, illustrious careers in the NFL. Well, great stuff. Awesome game. Uh, and then so for the second half of the show today, uh, I know this is a, a topic dear to your heart about Rose Bowl traditions with the Trojan marching band. And uh, if you, Dr. Bartner, what I was told, if you were a university You've gone to the Rose Bowl more than anyone except USC and your alma mater, Michigan. And your record of the Rose Bowl is 13 and 4. So that's that's pretty impressive. Yeah, you know, I when you when you think about it, the body of work, if I was a football coach, is pretty impressive. But but I feel very honored to to go 17 games and and with great teams and great coaches and 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 back be, you know be, before the playoffs and all the things they have today you know the rose bowl was always our goal our goal to get to that game and play the big 10 champion and uh it, it it's just uh you know the highlights of my career what can i say yeah well impressive record since uh, you were going there Thirteen four. It's sort of like when they say, like, if USC was a country, like how many Olympic medals they would have. Like, if you were a football team, you'd have more Rose Bowls than just about anybody. Besides, you know, uh, USC and Michigan. Um, but there's so we've talked about a lot of the band traditions. There's a lot of good Rose Bowl traditions, which makes this, I mean, a nice marriage between the Trojan Marching Band and the and the Rose Bowl. So I think you know, typically, uh, you guys convene on campus on December twenty eighth, so a few days before. Uh, the Rose Bowl, and then you do a lot of the same events leading up to it. The Lowry's Beef Bowl is awesome. We can talk about that a little bit. You guys do a public pep rally. I know you've had it at the Grove before, Universal City Walk, and uh, perform it at Disneyland. But maybe you want to start with the the Beef Bowl, what you guys do there. I, that's like one of my favorite meals in Los Angeles. So I love covering uh -huh. the Rose Bowl because we get to go eat there, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. When the band comes back, you know, we we work very hard. Because, uh, you know, we add new elements to the show. Uh, we bring back old elements. And, but it's basically a new show. So we're putting in a lot of time. But we also want the kids to have fun. It's, it's you know, over uh, Christmas break. And so we, we build in all these events. Uh, the Lowry's Beef Bowl, we, we do with a pep band. And... Uh, we basically play for the teams, well, our team, getting off the bus. And, uh, but of course, the highlight is these, these kids get to go in and, and have a meal. And we always like to do a rally for the Trojan fan base and get them excited about the game. And that's always fun. But the highlight, 
with the week leading up to the bowl game is our trip to Disneyland. You know, the team gets to go to Disneyland. So the band gets to do it, go to Disneyland. And, and uh, it's really a thrill. We usually uh, play a couple of numbers uh, by the train station. And then we march the full length of the park down Main Street. And, and I, I'll tell you, I never get tired I, of that. I, I worked 28 summers at Disneyland uh, directing the All-American College Band. So now to take the Trojan Marching Band down Main Street and having that tribute to Troy and fight on, bounce off the, the different shops, uh, it, it, it's just a thrill every time. And then the kids get out of uniform, put the horns away, and they, they get the run of the park for the rest of the day. And the cue to get back to the bus is when you hear those fireworks at about 10 o'clock or so, it's time to head back to the buses. That's back to the bus. Yeah, that picture I just put up, I'll put it up again. It was It's really cool to see all the Christmas decorations and stuff. And I mean, it's such a Southern California image. You know, you got the band and sunglasses and it's like yeah. a few days after Christmas, it's all holidays, but you know, they're out there getting a suntan. Yeah, well, you know, as they say, after the Rose Bowl every year, you get another 50,000 people move out from the Midwest. I being included as one of them so uh <laughs> what can i say yeah uh but you guys i mean it's it's work like you mentioned there's a 20 hours or so of rehearsal leading up to the rose bowl and the rose parade you guys do a jock rally uh just for the yeah. band and the team uh so i mean they're they're putting a lot of work in too right yes well and plus there's a new element which is called the rose parade i i, I mean this is a very, very, I, I think it's uh, maybe this and the Macy Parade are the most famous parades country. And and this is new for us because, you know, we're not a parade band. You know, we're, we're a, you know, a, a game band and, and halftime. So so we have to practice this. And, and we march a track at at Cromwell Field over and over again. And then uh, at the corner of Colorado Boulevard and whatever that street is that meets at pretty much near the top of the parade, there's a corner that you have to, you know, and there's cameras on either side of this corner. So it isn't like, uh, you can pull a Stanford band and just run around the corner and meet on the other side. No, you have to practice this corner. And our tradition is we play fight on nonstop all the way through <laughs> for about a mile and a half by all the television cameras because we want everybody, uh, you know, in the world to hear our fight song. And then we get when we get to the Bible Hill. We relax. So we, we, we actually spend a bunch of time uh, on our marching ability and turning this corner. Yeah, it's interesting because that's not normally something you guys would do. And that's an early, like, you get a, your call time's like 3.30 in the morning, right? You guys meet at the USC hotel, get some breakfast, and then jump on a bus to Pasadena. I mean, that's an early day for these guys. Yes. You know, it, it, I just shake my head and then just... Wow, it's good to be young because we give these kid a, kids a, a New Year's Eve party, and uh, you know we give them, a, you know, you know, little kids and little New Year's things that you, you know, you traditionally do. But we say when it's midnight, that's the cue. Go get a couple of hours sleep. You got to get at least two, three hours of sleep. And then the call is 3.30, and we're at the, the old Radisson Hotel across the street. And uh, we feed them breakfast because uh, it's, you know, I always, you know, make this analogy that uh, 
we not only have to do the game, but we've got to do this parade. This is 5.5 miles, starting usually, give or take, around 8 o'clock in the morning. And you've got to get there early because they're unloading floats, bands, uh, equestrian groups. Uh, you know, it's a major uh, production. And uh, so, so we're doing double duty on this, on this day. Yeah, is there any, because uh, I've been to the last couple and you see like delays for whatever reason. I think one, the flow caught on fire. Do you guys remember any sort of crazy delays or anything uh, from any of your uh, Rose Bowl parades? Well, I, I believe it or not, I hope, and I probably shouldn't say this, but I hope a float breaks down. Uh, and, and, you know, which is a delay because what this gives, you know, this gives us the opportunity to break ranks and to entertain the crowd on either side of the street. And then we can play, you know, Tusk and some of our other rock tunes. And then, uh, you know, when we, when we get the cue to move on, uh, you know, you just blow the whistle. And like magic, they go, Whoosh, get back in line and go. And the, and the crowd goes, wow, you know, these guys really have their act together. So it's kind of fun. It breaks up the 5.5 miles. Yeah. A little bit monotonous there. And then if you get the, the stop, but there's always some kind of stop. Um, but it ends in Victory Park. And then uh, it's a little sort of a whirlwind, right? You guys get in and out Burger and then some police escort and go to the game. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, yeah, they, they take care of us well. Really do. I mean, kids are hungry. Remember, they haven't eaten since breakfast at 3 30, So they're, they're starving. And then, uh, then they get on that bus, and, and I, from what I see, most of them just crash. They just crash and, and, and get that whatever it takes, half an hour, 45 minutes to the bowl. Uh, I'm usually awake, so I see this police escort. Because if we didn't have that escort, we'd still be stuck in Pasadena somewhere. Yeah. So, and, and as you're you know, pulling into that Rose Bowl, Adrenaline starts to go, and, and, and ex excitement, you know, sets in. So uh, it's just a wonderful experience. It, yeah, just I've I've done the Rose Parade the last couple of years by my, like myself recently, just going, and uh, it's I've never done it before. Living in Southern California all these years, mm -hmm. and it's definitely a great uh, tradition. That you know, if you if you live here in Southern California or across the country, I would recommend coming out and seeing it. Yeah. I know it's a different experience if you're working it, but you know it's certainly a, a spectacle. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, out of 17 parades, there was one parade where it rained. Oh. And it rained from, I'm talking from the, the uh, Orange Grove is the name of that street. From the moment that we stepped on Orange Grove at the top of the parade, it started to pour. And uh. it, all 5.5, and and. I guess the good news was um, we had a day off before the game itself because it was Sunday. I forget now, but maybe it was a, a Sunday and they didn't play the game on on a Sunday. Okay. They played it on the next day. So we, we got to – but if we had to do the – I mean, the raincoats were just – everything was just soaked. But yeah. the fact that we had this extra day – the uniforms dried out and we could wipe the horns off and but it's so seldom i mean i can almost count the days the games that it rained yeah i'm a hand but one parade it rained from the beginning to the end yeah that had to be that's not a fun experience walking five and a half miles playing your instrument in the rain i'm sure that's no fun um but i'm told <laughs> your favorite Rose Bowl, uh, 2004, and I'll pull up the, uh, this is the, the pregame shot. Um, and so this was your favorite pregame ever, I'm told. It was the 2004 edition where John Williams, uh, obviously great, you know, he was the guest conductor and he was the Tournament of Roses Grand Marshal. 
He composed a special arrangement of the Star Spangled Banner that was perform, performed both by USC and uh, the Michigan bands. Yes, you could say, well, we've done a lot of pregame shows and it's fun for us to play the anthem by ourselves. However, this arrangement by John Williams was stunning, was stunning. Uh, and uh, there's John right there. And having him conduct uh, both bands was, was thrilling. And again, if I had to pick a band to play with, well, to pick the Michigan band, I marched in for four years uh, as our partner. Uh, it, was, it was just awesome. And then they had, as they had fireworks, they had all campus a card stunt. They had a flyover by, you know, what are those bombers? I, I mean, it was a spectacular pregame show. So th that was really my, my, my favorite pregame show of all times. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, John Williams, it doesn't get much. I mean, every movie I can remember from the 80s that, you know, from Star Wars, the Indiana Jones, whatever, like that's it's John Williams, you know? Abs absolutely. And, uh, you know, I met him in 76 uh, with the Academy Awards and then I worked with him on the Olympics. So, he, you know, I kind of followed him or he followed me, you know, through my entire career. So now have him, having him conduct the bands was just a, a, a thrill of a lifetime. So that's your favorite pregame moment. Uh, the, in the 70s and 80s, the, the halftime shows, I think, were a little bit of a bigger deal. The good thing with the Rose Bowl is they do still have in the contract with ESPN that you mm -hmm. have to play a, a portion of the, uh, of the different halftime shows. I think one of your favorites, I believe it's 1973 with, I'll pull up a picture of Diana Ross, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Back in the day, uh, the band pretty much got the entire halftime show. And this is monumental for me and the Trojan Marching Band because uh, this is the first Rose Bowl that I've ever conducted. And here I was able through uh, Hank Ehrlich, Paramount Studios, to secure Diana Ross. She was in a movie Lady Sings the Blues, which was up for an Academy Award. And uh, so Paramount was promoting the movie. I was promoting the Trojan Marching Band. And Diana Ross came out and sang uh, the great Gershwin tune, Our Love is Here to Stay. And she just stopped the show. I mean, to this day, I got more compliments and letters and, and say, saying that this was the best halftime show that they've ever seen. Now, the band was still pretty young. This was like my third year. Yeah. And it was, you know, not the greatest Trojan marching band of all time. But Diana Ross, she was just marvelous. I mean, yeah. iconic. Yeah, look at those uniforms, those band uniforms, and that uh, fur. She's like a green fur she's wearing. That's crazy. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, these, these uniforms were uh, designed uh, by Disney. Uh, oh. Bob Yanni was the vice president of special effects, and, and he got me, you know, we always had a great relationship with the Disney company, and they designed the uniforms, and it was very Hollywood. It was very... Benner, you know, Spartacus kind of uniform. So, uh, and it contrasts with, with her gorgeous green emerald mink, whatever, shawl. Yeah. Uh, she, I mean, it was like, wow, oh, you know, it, it's a picture that you never forget. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, okay, so some of the others, a few other ones from the 70s uh, halftime shows I wanted to mention. I don't know the story, but 1975, Tower of Power, there was some. You got some complaints about that one? What was going on there? Yeah. You, you know, you know, we go through these podcasts and and uh, everything's just wonderful with the, with the band. Uh, however, 
uh, we selected a, the next guest artist was his group Tower of Power, and they had the number one hit in the country. Uh, uh, you're still a young man. Uh, I think that starts the opening lyrics. And uh, the complaints were not so much about the music, but, you know, they looked like a rock and roll band, if you know what I mean. You know, long hair, uh, you know, very casual clothes. And, and the complaints were, uh, you know, like, in this very classical football game, and the people, citizens of Pasadena, how could we let these people on the field? And, and yet, uh, and it's interesting, you know, when they came over and rehearsed with the band, the football team came over because they wanted to see this group. That's how popular this group was with student age kids. Yeah. And they had this tune that we played a pregame called What is Hit? And it's just the hottest funk chart that you ever wanted to hear. But it didn't sit well with the uh, Pasadena folks. Yeah, they, they are a little particular about what they want there at the Rose Bowl. So it's interesting. You got some complaints on that one. And 77 <laughs> was more of a Los Angeles-based theme. And I think you guys won some awards for the, the 77 halftime show for that Rose Bowl. Yes, it, it, I, you know, anytime you can share uh, something with the football team, you, you know, you, you just got to feel so proud. And uh, the city of L.A. had this huge banquet and they had a table of, of, of USC people. And I got to sit next to John Robinson. So here they're honoring John for beating Ohio State in the Rose Bowl, and they're honoring the Trojan Marching Band for uh, saluting Los Angeles, the home of entertainment, uh, some, uh, something like that. And uh, But to share the same space with uh, John, and I think that the captain of the football team was there. I had my drum major there. And to be part of this, in front of really the, the city uh, was a big honor. The, uh, also the 1981, and this has to be a favorite of mine, but the debuting Tusk. So that had to be huge. I mean, cause that's not, you know, to this day you say it's the only marching band with a platinum album. So having uh, Tusk there at the halftime show, that must've been pretty, pretty special for you. <laughs> yes. And uh, again, I've always, I've always been very competitive. You know, maybe I picked this up from Marv Goo. And, and you know, to me, uh, it's, it's, there's a secondary battle that goes on between one band and another. And, uh, and so for me to say at the end of my show, and now we'd like to close our show with a, a top 10 hit by Fleetwood Mac, Featuring the Trojan marching band, Roar. Here is Husk. For me to say that, it's like, well, and I think I, I think we were we we're playing Ohio State again, but still, Ohio State's great band, great band. I mean, it's the arguments here, but they don't have a platinum album. No, and they've never performed with Fleetwood Mac. So <laughs> that was the first time we performed it on you know at halftime and uh it was just kind of a, a thrill well i'm told the the 1985 uh halftime show at the rose bowl is your favorite there was five thousand like red white and blue balloons and uh i'm gonna i have a little video clip so I, maybe i'll play that and then we'll kind of get your thoughts on uh what we got going on here dr Bartner. so here's uh here's the clip
took a bit, but we got the Statue of Liberty there at the end. Look a little, maybe a little, she had a rough night the night before. <laughs> I don't know. It, oh, you know, you know it, <laughs> I, I look at it and, and it was, it was right at the end of halftime and, and it's right in front of the Ohio State football team. You can see our team, you know, running behind and uh, it never worked during practice. You can see, you know, it was kind of weaving and bobbing its way up and it'd get halfway and then psh, it would just collapse. And, uh, you know, maybe the camera was trying to cover for us because it pulled away where it normally would collapse. And then he came back and there she was in all her glory. And we had a huge balloon uh, release and red, white and blue, of course. And we were playing God bless uh, America. Uh, it was just a great as patriotic moment as you could have. Yeah. So that's cool. That's a good, uh, good favorite moment. There's so fun. So many Rose Bowls uh, for USC. You forget, but you know, USC's won more Rose Bowls than anyone's been to. So uh, it's uh, and Michigan's second, I believe. Right. I, I, I like I said the, earlier. It's I like the the merging of all these great USC band traditions that you were building up in the '70s and '80s and have stuck around with all the great traditions of the Rose Bowl. So it's just college football is just such a tradition laden sport and having you being around for 50 years the rose bowl around it, that just it's been a great marriage it seems between the trojan marching band and the rose bowl yes i, I can't say enough and then the, you know the famous announcer keith jackson mm -hmm. daughter who went to us she was a, f a flutist oh i didn't and, realize that i didn't know that okay right i got to know her and obviously i got to know keith and 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 he would only you know, always very neutral guy, but you could tell uh, he would always, you know, his voice would pick up a little bit when he would introduce the Trojan marching band. And, uh, uh, but you, you, you build these relationships through the years and, and it's, and, and it's, it's what's great about USC. Yeah. You know, we're a family and, and we've all grown together and built these great traditions together. And it, what, what makes it a very special place. Yeah. All right. Well, we have one final announcement. Uh, Dr. Bartner recently celebrated his 80th birthday. One request for a gift, a donation to the Trojan Marching Band Member Pandemic Relief Fund. All funds will go directly to the band's students to help them financially weather the pandemic. As many are unable to work or get internships during this time, you can text USC Band to 41444. That's USC Band to 41444. 444 to donate or see the link in the description here on the video. But uh, Dr. Bartner, this has been a good one. Anything else you want to mention about the 1980 Rose Bowl or, or no, Rose Bowl traditions? Uh, no, I'm just exciting. Uh, if this was a Hollywood movie, <laughs> we would end up in the Rose Bowl for my last season. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I'm thrilled that we're playing Trojan football. Uh, I'm hoping we can get to that championship game and, you know, beat Oregon or whoever we're playing and uh, get back to the Rose Bowl. Yeah. And, you know, like we said, I mentioned earlier, you know, I'm always, when we would speak at events, you'd tell me I'm being too doom and gloomy. This is a team, though, that's really talented. Uh, I mean, winning the Pac-12 South has not been, you know, Clay has been really good against Pac-12 South opponents. And that's five of your opponents are going to be Pac-12 South. And one crossover game that, you know, and to right. USC's got a real shot though. You're this could be another Rose Bowl year for you. Even though it's a weird year and a pandemic year, I, you know, I wouldn't count that as a Rose Bowl year. You know, count that out. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you once again <laughs> and thank you everybody for uh for watching our art cast and I'll see you next week. Bye on. <laughs>